This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Welcome to the legislature today. I'm Randy Yoey. It is day 29 of this 60-day session. We are almost halfway through. The House advanced eight bills to the Senate today, including bills that help provide for pregnant and parenting teen mothers and fathers, for getting dentures while on Medicaid, and patriotic societies recruiting in West Virginia schools. There were some not so obvious reasons for proposing House Bill 4863, the Patriotic Access to Students in Schools Act. The bill provides patriotic societies the opportunity to speak and recruit at public schools. So what patriotic societies can recruit in West Virginia schools? Well, the list is defined in U.S. code as youth groups that include Little League Baseball, Future Farmers of America, and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. Now that sounds benign, but I'm told there are challenges from several West Virginia school principals. Delegate Rick Hillenbrand, a Republican from Hampshire County and longtime Boy Scout leader, says the issue for some school principals is not who is on the federally approved list, but one of convenience or perhaps inconvenience. I think honestly it's a, a fear that the principals typically have with regards to, gee, if I let this group in, am I going to have to let every group in? So uh, the U.S. federal government dealt with that a long time ago with Title 36. So there really doesn't need to be that fear. The bill passed 95 to 0. House Bill 4933 makes it so dentures are not counted toward the $1,000 yearly limit provided by the Medicaid program for diagnostic, preventive, and restorative dental service. So an adult 21 years or older would be able to purchase dentures without it counting against their Medicaid dental coverage. The bill passed 94 to 0. House Bill 5179 creates JC's Law, offering support for middle and high school young women who are pregnant and parenting young women and men. It provides at least eight weeks of excused absences for a mother for the birth of the student's child. It offers two weeks excused absence for the father of the child and medical and academic support for both. J.C.'s law passed 96 to 0. Today, the Senate passed seven bills, including a bill designed to make certain drugs affordable to low-income and uninsured people. Brianna Heaney has more. Senate Bill 325 addresses pushback from pharmaceutical manufacturers to the expansion of the 340B program. Under the federal 340B program, healthcare providers like hospitals and community health centers that fit certain criteria, like being a public or nonprofit organization with a high volume of low income or uninsured patients, can get drugs at a discounted rate. This allows them to sell the drugs at the discounted rate to low-income or uninsured patients and provides extra money to help those patients. Those healthcare institutions are known in the program as safety net providers. This program is for patients who make too much to qualify for Medicaid, but not enough to be able to afford often expensive prescriptions. Pharmacies are able to participate in the 340B program by way of being contract pharmacies of the safety net providers. This is especially important in rural areas where some of those safety net providers are hours away. In 2020, manufacturers started implementing restrictions on contract pharmacies. For example, if a safety net provider ordered insulin for its contract pharmacies, sometimes drug manufacturers would refuse to send the insulin to rural pharmacies. Senate Bill 325 seeks to change that by forcing them to ship to rural contract pharmacies or to impose a $50,000 fine per order for failing to do so. Senator Charles Trump, a Republican from Morgan County, explained the bill on the Senate floor. The gravamen of this bill is that it prohibits manufacturers of drugs from trying to restrict their availability uh, to contract entities under the 340B program. The 340B program is a federal program enacted by the Congress, and it was designed to make available uh, at low cost. Uh, important life-saving drugs to people 
and it is uh, critically important in a state, a rural state, sparsely populated state like West Virginia. Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo, a Republican from Kanawha County, says the bill will help thousands of rural West Virginians who need affordable prescriptions. The people that, that um, uh, are the most in need are on Medicaid, they can get their medications. What, what this program really does is helps those that are trying to climb out of, of poverty, they're, um, they don't qualify for Medicaid, uh, and they're trying to afford their medicines, and they got real health problems, and we're trying to help those, and we have done that for 20, 30 years. And then about a year or so ago, uh, Pharma decided, well, uh, we haven't made enough profit, so what we're going to do is we're going to strict. They never argued that these patients don't qualify for a federal program that's been around for 30 years. The only thing they did is said, you've got to drive 60, 90 miles to go get it. We know that the federal program allows you to get your much needed medicines to literally keep you alive. These are sometimes cancer therapies and blood pressure and diabetes. All this, all they did last year was said, we're going to restrict your ability to have access where you live. And so as long as you can drive 60, 90 miles, uh, you, you, you still qualify. All we're doing is standing up for our people in West Virginia to say, no, that is not the intent of the bill, and return that back to the, the small towns and cities and local pharmacies where people can get access. I can tell you, oftentimes patients don't have the gas money to hardly drive across town. Uh, it breaks my heart when, when, when people literally have set hours to catch a bus just to get across town to get to their appointment. They certainly don't have the ability to sometimes jump in a car and drive 60, 90 miles to a major hospital facility to get their, their monthly medications. Kubo says this is part of a slew of bills addressing Big Pharma. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Brianna Heaney in Charleston. Today was Black Policy Day at the Capitol, where advocates gathered to talk about legislation affecting people of color in the Mountain State. Brianna Heaney has that story. Attendees formed a circle around the rotunda and sang together to start the day. Organizer Sonia Armstrong says she and others are here to support and advocate for policies that will help and protect people of color in the state. Well, today is just amazing, electrifying, just the spirit of being here and to see all of the people who are here to support the policies that we are talking about here today. I am representing my sorority for this particular event where our platform is She Justice, social, health, and economic justice for all. We are doing this to make sure that we have everything for West Virginia. What is good for blacks is good for all of us. Gold crowns dotted the rotunda a symbolic accessory to address legislation moving through the House and the Senate, the Crown Act. That's the name for bills that seek to prohibit discrimination based on hairstyle and hair texture. The bills would protect natural hairstyles for people of color. Crown Act bills have been seen by the legislature for the past five years, but have not been passed into law. Yet, Crystal Good founder of the independent publication Black by God, says this is the year that the Crown Act should be passed. We're seeing some momentum again, as we always do every year, but that's a really important bill. Samaya Price says action taken by an employer based on someone's natural hair type is a form of racial discrimination. And I feel like it should be passed like immediately because I don't feel like we should be judged or not allowed to do certain stuff because of our hair, especially when it's part of our history. Good is also advocating for doula legislation that she says would help combat maternal death for women of color in the state. And just so that folks know, you know, black babies are dying at a greater rate of white babies in West Virginia and white babies are dying at a greater rate across the country. We have a crisis here. We need to talk about it. Uh, we need to do something about it. Many young people attended the event and Armstrong says she hopes that everyone in attendance especially the young people that visited the Capitol today, remember to use their constitutional right to vote.
We have got to vote because these are the legislators that we put into place who are going to pass these laws. So we must come out and vote when it's time and talk to our legislator and talk to our neighbors. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Brianna Heaney in Charleston. The House of Delegates passed a bill this week that would restrict how data from community air monitors can be used. The state's industry and mining trade groups supported House Bill 5018, while community and environmental groups opposed it. Curtis Tate spoke with Delegate Evan Hansen, a Monongalia County Democrat, and Lucia Valentine from the West Virginia Environmental Council about this legislation. There was a, a lot of debate uh, this week about uh, House Bill 5018. There was a public hearing about it uh, last week. The bill actually did pass the House of Delegates, uh, but Delegate Hansen, uh, you were one of the no votes. Uh, can you tell us why? I have some significant concerns about this bill. It's related to community air monitoring, which is the type of monitoring that people and organizations are starting to do across the state at their homes or in their communities. And the bill specifically forbids the use of community air monitoring data by the Department of Environmental Protection, and it also forbids the use in court. And I think we should be embracing that data, we should be using that data, and giving it the weight that it deserves. If it's good data, let's use it. If it's not good, then let's not use it. Uh, Lucia, how is community air monitoring data currently used? Is that something that the Department of Environmental Protection uses for regulatory uh, purposes? Yeah, so 5018 says that community air monitoring data cannot be used for regulatory purposes under Section 110 and 319 of the Clean Air Act. Um, and that data currently is not being used for regulatory purposes by DEP. And so, um, you know, we agree. We think that this data should be vetted and verified and corroborated, um, but it's not currently being used for regulatory purposes. So, uh, But it is used in some cases uh, in lawsuits. Well, um, so this, under Section G, this bill um, wants to change that so that um, verified and vetted community air monitoring data cannot be used as evidence in court. And so kind of like what uh, Delegate Hansen was talking about, we have concerns about legislating what data can and cannot be used as evidence in court. Um, we have a judicial system set up in place for that, uh, and we think that it should be left to the experts, the courts, and the, um, uh, the agencies to determine what data is available and appropriate to use. We heard last week in the public hearing that the Department of Environmental Protection only has 18 of its own air monitors statewide, you know, the 55 counties in West Virginia. That, that doesn't seem like a whole lot. So how does, how does community air monitoring help fill in those gaps? That's one reason why community air monitoring is so important. There's just a few air monitoring stations that the Department of Environmental Protection has across the state nowhere near one per county. And the other air monitoring data is done by the facilities with the smokestacks. And they test the air at the smokestack and at the fence line, but there's no testing out in the communities where people live, where people actually breathe the air. So if we're concerned about whether air pollution is actually reaching the people and causing harm, like asthma or something like that, we need to know whether there's high or low levels of pollution where people are actually breathing the air. So it's really important to have this data. It adds to the data that is already being collected. But going back to something you just said, uh, industries themselves have their own monitors and their own data, and they can use it in ways that, that, that uh, uh, citizens would not be able to use their data under this bill. Is that correct? That's one thing that's, in my opinion, just unconscionable about this bill. It's saying that if you're in court, the corporation, the company could introduce their data and use it in court to defend themselves. But the plaintiffs, like a person or a community group, is forbidden from introducing their data in court. And that's tipping the scales of justice. That would be like having a divorce case in the legislature saying husbands are allowed to introduce evidence, but wives are not allowed to introduce evidence. Or that would be like having a criminal case where you say that the police can introduce evidence, but the perpetrator can't. It's fundamentally unfair. Courts already have a process in place to challenge the data that's suggested to be introduced, uh, to verify it, and for a judge to make a decision whether it remains in court or not. 
if the if the court finds it's junk data, he'll throw it out of court and it won't be used. But if it's reliable, he'll allow it in. Mm -hmm. Some of your colleagues, I think, uh, uh, question whether um, this actually takes power away from judges and courts uh, to use whatever data they they consider. Uh, well, you know, whatever data they, they, they seem appropriate. Is that maybe the basis for a, a potential legal challenge to uh, this, uh, if it becomes law? I think it is the basis of a legal challenge because the, we have separation of powers and the court system makes determinations about evidence. They set the rules of evidence. It's not up to the legislature to set the rules of evidence. And that's what this bill does. And Lucia, it, it, should should there be a legal challenge to this uh, if it if it gets to that point, um, would it be your organization uh, 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 doing the challenging, or who would who, who would uh, would bring that court challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think um, West Virginia Environmental Council and our member groups are going to continue to flag the judicial concerns with this bill, especially as it's headed over to the Senate. So um, that's kind of where our efforts are lying right now, is to continue to raise these, uh, these concerns. And, and Delegate Hansen, I think you s said that, uh, that this is coming from, from outside West Virginia. It's not necessarily something that, that um, originated within, within the state. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I haven't heard specific manufacturing facilities uh, speak up in favor of this bill. Um, I just get the sense that it's just coming from outside and uh, there's, there's concern among certain organizations that there's more and more community air monitoring that's being done. There's some federal funding that's being provided to community groups. And the reason they're doing that is that there's concern that certain communities have borne the brunt of pollution over many years. And one way to address that is to have data to understand whether or not the air is clean or dirty. And so I think there's a concerted effort that's starting to come out now. We're seeing it in West Virginia first to push back on that data and to make sure it's not considered. Yeah, and to that point, this bill really sends the wrong message to those who are living in communities uh, that have a higher burden of air pollution, those who have been fighting for um, clean air in their communities. Again, this, this data helps represent pollution levels where people live in their neighborhoods, and we should be caring about that um, and making that data accessible um, and, and verified. What's an example of a place, a community, that would be put at a disadvantage if they couldn't use uh, the, the data? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, South Charleston uh, has really suffered with ethylene oxide pollution um, for decades now. And so I think, um, you know, they have some of the highest cancer rates in, in the country uh, because of air pollution from chemical facilities. So I think that's, you know, one place close to the capital that, um, you know, would really suffer and would really, you know, be sending the wrong message to the, the constituents and people who live in South Charleston um, that, you know, their uh, verified community air monitoring data could not be used in court. Well, another thing I, th I think I'd note about the, uh, the public hearing last week is that the, uh, the people who came to speak there were overwhelmingly against this bill. Um, there were a couple of, of folks from, from uh, industry, the, uh, the Manufacturers Association, the Gas and Oil Association, who spoke in support of it. The, uh, the vote, though, in, in the House was a bit more the other way. Um, what, what, what's going on there, Delegate Hansen? I think people know where their checks are coming from, their campaign contributions are coming from. And so it's difficult sometimes for people to, to vote against interest groups that are contributing to their campaigns. Is it difficult for the Environmental Council to get a, a, a friendly ear sometimes in, in um, this particular legislative body? Yeah, I think, you know, the work of the West Virginia Environmental Council is to continue to raise raise these concerns um, and stand up to, you know, interest groups to make sure that our voice is at the table and that we're standing up for those who are burdened, again, by air pollution, by water pollution, and other environmental, environmental concerns across the state. So I think our job is to advocate against these harmful bills and harmful legislation that puts the health of our um, environment and communities at risk. Well, now, one of the, the bill sponsors and, um, and also one of the, uh, uh, the, the trade group heads uh, that I just mentioned 
uh, said something to the effect of, well, well, you know, this doesn't stop community air monitoring. It can, it, it's, go, it's been going on and it, it can go on. Um, I mean, is that, is that true? I mean, I think overall it sends the wrong message and our main concern again is that this verified community air monitoring data cannot be used as evidence. We don't think that that should be legislated. Um, and again, the data that's collected by community air monitoring is already not being used for regulatory purpose, so we don't see a need to even legislate that part um, either. So um, those are our main concerns. And they, they want credit for not outlawing community air monitoring? I mm -hmm. mean, come on. Right. This, everybody has the right to do whatever type of environmental monitoring they want to do in their communities, and they don't deserve any credit for not making that illegal. That's just ridiculous. Can, can you know, either of you maybe, maybe just kind of explain a little bit briefly about how these monitors work? I mean, what are, how do you get one, and, and, and what, what does it do? What does it tell you? Well, they're, they're readily available. There's different vendors that sell them. You could buy them online. They might mm -hmm. cost a few hundred dollars. And you follow the instructions and hook them up, and they um, communicate over the internet. And so there, there's a network of these monitors that you could look up online and see how good or bad the air quality is um, anywhere where they're set up. And a good example of that was last year with the Canadian wildfires, where I know I was looking at these maps because up in Morgantown, you just look out the window and it was very smoky. And th they were very helpful because they allowed us to see where the plumes of the smoke were and to make some predictions about how um, healthy or unhealthy the air was then and might be a few hours later. Uh, are, are, they, are they all calibrated similarly? I mean, is there, is there any concern maybe about quality control here with, with these devices? I think that that's always a, a concern with environmental data. and. Um, and that's why it's important to give the data the weight that it deserves. That's the term that's used in court. And so there's certain types of highly validated environmental data, whether it's water or air, that uses certain EPA approved methods, and that'll be given greater weight. Um, it's probably gonna be more precise, but that doesn't mean that these out of the box air monitors are automatically invalid. There are ways to use them properly according to manufacturers instructions or there are ways to potentially correlate their results with the more expensive test methods to gain some confidence about whether they're accurate or not so just saying flat out that they're inadmissible is is way off the deep end in terms of how to make an informed judgment about that data did you have anything to add um, no, I mean, we agree. I think that, um, you know, most of the air monitors also measure like PM 2.5. Um, and so that's pretty particular consistent. Particulate matter. Particulate matter. And so that's pretty consistent. Um, and like you said, there's different uh, weights for different kinds of data. And we just think that the, the um, agencies and experts should have full authority to, to vet and determine what data is, um, you know, appropriate. Well, in the remaining time I, that we have, a couple of minutes, um, uh, I'd like for you to talk about uh, a couple of solar bills that have been introduced that you are, in fact, for, I, I believe. Uh, Delegate Hansen? Yeah, one of the things that's been challenging in West Virginia over the last decade or so is that our electric bills have gone up and up faster than any other state in the country. And one reason for that is that we don't have a diverse electricity supply. And so there are some bills to open that up. One of them is the community solar bill, and that allows people to buy essentially a subscription to a portion of a solar project, mm -hmm. and uh, they would save money immediately on their electric bills. And that's one. The second bill is, is related to net metering, and that's what is done when you install solar on your rooftop now. If you generate more electricity than you use, you get credit for that electricity from the utility. And the utility wants to reduce the amount of credit that they give to homeowners and business owners. And we want to protect the current system, keep things the way they are, and allow people and businesses to be compensated fairly for the electricity that they put back into the grid from their solar panels. Um, Lucia, with about a minute or so left, uh, can, you, can you tell us about where your organization is on, on these uh, solar 
bills? Yes, certainly. The West Virginia Environmental Council is um, in support and favor of both the community solar bills that have been introduced this year and the net metering bill that was just introduced in the House. Um, like Delegate Hansen said, you know, we have some of the highest utility costs in the electricity costs, excuse me, in the country, and so we really see that community solar as a way um, for uh, West Virginians to lower their utility bills um, and have access to, you know, affordable energy. Um, community solar would allow people who rent their homes or have shaded roofs or can't afford the cost of uh, installing up, uh, rooftop solar up front to have access to this type of energy. So it's really important that we are creating jobs um, and creating opportunities for people to access affordable energy across West Virginia. Well, uh, Lucia Valentine, Delegate Evan Hansen, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for spending this time with us. Catch the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. And remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting covers the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia Channel. I'm Randy Yowie from everyone here at WVPV. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward.